I want to get, uh, get your guys' thoughts on this, okay? So we can transition a little bit to, to Q2 and what I'm expecting from that. I was talking with Adam Bergman. Shout out to him on the phone today. I am so scared and excited about Q2. I'm excited. Well, let me do why I'm scared for us. I'm scared because management guided 1% or 2% revenue growth quarter over quarter. Yeah, we know they're going to be gap profitable. And maybe they may surprise to the upside on customer growth, even though the rate of customer growth has been declining. I am scared Q2 we don't figure out customer growth expansion. Revenue comes in flat. Maybe we beat by a million or 2 million and we're gap profitable, but it's not that exciting, right? Like that could be a quarter and maybe the stock stays where it is or maybe it tanks because it's just like not that exciting. And if anything, the justification of a almost $40 billion company now just can't be justified with that type of growth. That's the, the bear case for it. And there's obviously some other things that could go wrong, but carp could bang on the table, but that's the bear case. The bull case is they figured out their customer count. And even if the revenue has not been, um, um, generated off that customer account. If they have an increase in customer account, we know that Q3, Q4, that revenue will eventually be recognized because they got the customers to be able to get to that point. And then if the market tanks, it's a massive buying opportunity because if they increase customer account, but the high frequency trading algorithms don't care about customer account, all they care about is EPS and revenue. That's a dip that we need to buy because we know the revenue is coming. The interesting thing about Dan Ives is it's a week before Q2 earnings and he puts out this report. And so I'm just kind of like spitballing in my head here. I'm like, I don't think a guy with the type of credibility Dan Ives has, he travels across the world, international institutional clients recommending what stocks to buy. He is a stock picker and he's a tech stock picker. I don't think a week before earnings, he's putting his reputation on the line for them to tank to 11 bucks or 12 bucks or eight bucks because they just absolutely shit the quarter. I think, and this is me with tinfoil hat theory, I think a lot of these Wall Street insiders truly know people in the game. I don't think they put out a report because he could have put out this report weeks ago. Nothing has changed from, nothing has changed over the past three months. If he wanted to put out this report three months ago or now. I think the reason he's doing it before Q2 earnings is to make himself look good. And the reason he's making himself look good is because he got some type of confirmation either by the street or by pound to themselves, which I know is illegal, but we know this shit happens, that Q2 is going to be a good quarter. What are your thoughts on a guy like him putting his reputation on the line before Q2 numbers? Because he could wait right till after Q2. He doesn't have to do this right now for him to be this bullish on the company. Any thoughts on that as a concept? I think that somebody like him doesn't really care about one quarter. I think he cares more about the next five to 10 years. As yeah, but I don't, I don't agree with that because if, you, if that's the case, why not wait till after Q2? I fundamentally disagree with that. Because why, he doesn't care about you, Q2. No, but so why wouldn't you put the thing after Q2? Why would you, like, let's say Q2 tanks the bed and he looks, he looks, pretty dumb so this is this is the problem that i have with a lot of the people in the palantir community and you know i'm not not trying to shit on anybody here but like i look at q2 as a check-in i don't look at q2 as a be-all end-all and i think a lot of people in this community still do it's like so who cares if it slips no, but Matt, 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 i agree with you i think a lot of us agree with you i'm talking about from like i'm talking about pure psychological like let's forget we're palantir shareholders why would an analyst say a stock that's at 16 is going to go to 25 a week before earnings if he doesn't give a fuck about Q2 earnings, and then if it tanks after Q2, then he can put it out, and or then he can put out a revised Because update. he's not caring about Q2 at all. No, that so is incorrect. Even on that's incorrect. He's a short-term Wall Street guy. He downgraded Tesla on the Twitter overhang when that was a stupid reason to downgrade Did he give He did it because he was caring about the short-term updates on Tesla. Did he give a time frame on 25 price target? No. He's, he's just using okay. 10x. If he's not giving a time frame, then it's irrelevant. No, I disagree with that. Look, these these guys that put out price targets, there's a reason Bank of America went from 13 to 18 after Q1. Hold on, let me let me speak. It depends what Palantir delivers. Right, but if, let me let me, let me, let me just, goes let me, down. Let me finish. The can, point he the reason he up. the reason Bank of America put that price target out is because the numbers got a little bit better to them. Like, okay, cool. The reason he should care about Q2 is because why did he downgrade Tesla to 175? And went and dropped to a hundred in January. It's because he thought Elon paid forty four billion and he's spending it way too much time. The long term on Tesla, it's a what a four trillion dollar company or something. So why does he care about this one quarter? He absolutely cares about a quarter because these guys' um, reputations are on the line. They would lose institutional clients if they get the quarter to quarter wrong. So to me, I, I'm just putting it out there. I think he absolutely cares. If Poundtree goes to ten bucks, you think he's going to be happy? You think his institutional clients aren't going to be like, what the fuck? You just said it was going to 25 and now it's at 10 bucks. And he's going to have to be like, oh yeah, they had a shitty quarter. 
Like, so why did you tell us to buy the stock right before they had a shitty quarter? Your, your fucking analyst so, couldn't figure out it was going to be a so shitty let's quarter. Let's go back to what he said. Was When he was talking for that five minutes when we opened the, the beginning of the conversation, was he talking about next week we think it's going to be X, Y, Z, or in two weeks when they give their earnings report it's going to be X, Y, Z? Or was he talking about the long-term trillion-dollar market opportunity that they have in AI and how Palantir is going to be at the forefront of it? That That's irrelevant to what I'm saying. No, it's I don't. I don't relevant. think it's irrelevant no, at all. You guys are hung up. You guys are hung up on why he put out the report. We all know he's bullish on Palantir. My question is the timing of it. Why didn't this happen a month ago? Because he wants to be first, not last. To him, it's wait about a month ago he could have been first. So why didn't he do it a month ago? He may have not come to the epiphany a month ago. What do you mean? So he was. So they they researched the company in one month, and now they're like, oh, Palantir is a bit. No, they've been doing research for a long time. This look, something may have clicked. Obviously, nobody knows what it was, but something made him do it. Something clicked. And he believes that this is going to be a very good long-term opportunity. And if it goes down, he's just going to come out and say, doesn't matter. The TAM is still there. The opportunity is still there. This is an even better buying opportunity to dollar cost average into the position. Yeah, yeah I, just think, I think if he's thinking about a 3Q or 4Q target, why is he bringing up trillion dollar market opportunities? Yeah, that, I mean, no, that's just him marketing his pitch, right? Like he has to market his shit. Carp says trillion dollars. My point is the timing of this is oddly peculiar because if you don't give a fuck about this quarter, then just wait till Q 2s after. It's not like any. It's not like he's in a rush to be the first guy talking about pound here on Wall Street. Okay, but if they smoke Q two and it goes up, twenty five doesn't become nearly as. So that's my point. That's my point. I think he's a, he's he's evaluated the risk reward yeah, maybe he's, because he's, he's really he's taking dug a deep. gamble of when to put it out. No, it no, no. But look, here's my second argument. You're forgetting the first reason I even brought this up. I don't think he wants to let his reputation rest on a gamble with a speculative name like Palantir. Because if they tank the bed, he looks really stupid for saying $25. I don't think it hurts. He's not been that wrong for the past five years. He's been right on a lot of stuff. He's not like Kathy. That's like Roku to a thousand. In the like short that. term, if Palantir goes down, I don't think it hurts him at all. I don't think it hurts him. I just, I just think the, uh, I think he would, if he knew it was going to be a bad quarter, he wouldn't put out that report right before. He would just wait. Just like let the quarter happen. And then if it goes to 11, you could say price target 18. That's still, you know, a huge upgrade in my opinion. So let's go back to Amit being worried about Q2. So I want to throw some numbers out there. So pound to your guy for revenue to come in between 528 to 532 million in Q2 and revenue of 2.18 billion and 2.23 billion for the full year. In Q1 PLTR, they delivered 525.2 million in revenue, which is 24% of the low end estimates and 23.5% of the high end estimates for 2023. For Palantir to meet its 2023 full year revenue guidance, it would need to generate an average of 553.27 million in each quarter, Q2, Q3, and Q4, to meet the low end projection and an average of 569.9 million to meet the high end estimates. Yeah. So look, that is from my article that I wrote last week. I crunched all the numbers. I'm expecting Palantir to deliver at least 550 million in Q2. I think they're gonna deliver more, but for them to meet their low end estimates, they're gonna, if you look at their sequential arc of re quarter over quarter revenue growth, they're going to have to throw out at least 550 million to keep that arc just to meet the low end estimates. And if we see anywhere from 550 to 575 million in Q2, it's going to be a strong indication that they're going to make the high end estimates this year. Now, see, here's the interesting thing. Dan Ives thinks they're only going at 531 next quarter. He thinks there's only going to be 16% revenue growth for the whole year. Maybe. And he's still giving them a $25, which is so interesting to me, right? I'm like, what the fuck does this guy know? He's estimating conservatively below Palantir's guidance and still putting a $25 price yeah, target on that. That goes back to Matt's point that he's looking at the very long-term TAM of this and the opportunity. I agree. And that Palantir is very far ahead of everybody else. And, you know, look, their high end is 2 point, um, 2.3, I think. 2.3. So, yeah. and that's eighteen percent. Palantir would need to record five hundred and fifty million in Q two, five hundred and fifty 
575 million in Q3 and 601 million in Q4 to generate 2.25 billion in annual revenue. I mean, they would need to average 4.6% quarter over quarter revenue growth to do that. I think they're going to do it and getting past that 600 million quarterly revenue number on a quarter over quarter growth in Q4, I'm not saying it's going to happen in Q2 or Q3, but eventually getting there this year, it sets the stage to eventually getting to that billion revenue quarter basis. And when you do that and you look at a 33% free cash flow margin, that means on an annualized basis with no quarter over quarter revenue growth, you're generating a billion of free cash flow annually. And then when you start throwing in that growth, you're over a billion free cash flow positive annually and it's growing. Like these are very specific numbers that are very important to the upswing that we could possibly see on shares. Coats rep says I've saw an AIP deep dive and release Shams vision for foundry and come out LMs. I wrote an article about this pound was made for this moment and they will be it. Matt, go ahead. No, I agree. I, I, I think I said this very early in the May timeframe when they first gave us the AIP demo at UDOC. And um, I think with it, it wasn't like, oh, we had to tailor foundry to do this or, oh, we had to, you know, it was seamless. It was like as if everything that they'd be doing in foundry, the organization of the ontology, the language models, exactly what Codestrap was saying was set up for this next stage. And that's why I'm sitting here being like, what else are they sitting on that they're not telling us in terms of what's going on in the future? Because they have this roadmap planned out yeah. and they know where they're going. Because if, if they weren't, AIP would not have been so seamless, right? It would have been trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole and it just wouldn't have worked. But in reality, it was like, oh, shit. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was organized the way that it was. We know that that's a warehouse. And the example that I, they showed us, which was like a, a, piece of a, a piece of a sales equipment, which feeds into a, a product, is no longer available. So they have to source it from a, a warehouse within the next... 50 miles or something like that and it knows the ontology of everything that's being asked who the stakeholders are to be able to email back and forth and who has the decision rights and and that is something that's already kind of built in within foundry and, and gotham and and so it was just very interesting. It's, it's, it's a good point. Also, I, I said this publicly already. I had lunch with a Pounder employee last week. I actually got to see their New York offices. And uh, I asked him, I was like, yo, um, you know, why don't you work at Google? Like, you're a pretty smart guy. And he was like, I can't imagine working at Google and looking at my fellow employee next to me playing Candy Crush on his iPhone. And, and so his point was just like, there's a mission at can you Can you answer if this person's initials were SG? No, okay. it was not SG. Why do you know someone? SG? No, I don't. Know. Yes, I do. Okay, uh, but but his point was just like I, you know I I I'm working here and I'm working like a dog. Like he's working like crazy. He's like a technical dude because I believe in the fuck in the shit that we're doing. And he could probably make more at Google or Amazon. And so like that to me kind of validated a little bit more about the culture as well. What you're saying, Matt, is like these guys actually think they're building the future, and that's why it took him seven rounds of interviews to to get into into the company. 